Okay, everybody, um, we will let people in as we as we go through. Um, but hello and uh, welcome to this session on the secret to connected TV on a on a budget and some advice on how you can rework your current footage uh, and hopefully we're going to leave you with some takeaways of some other tips about getting started on connected TV. So we're here to help bust the myths around getting started and to show that it's not just about um, small budgets, but there's also real opportunity to grow and succeed when it comes to connected TV advertising. So we want you to take away as many actions and talking points as possible today. So please do feel free to jump into uh, the chat room, leave comments, ask questions, and I'll endeavor to weave them through our conversations. And um, maybe also say hello, uh, let us know where you're from um, and what brand or business you're checking in from um, as well. Uh, I'm delighted to be joining you from the UK. So I'm coming to you from Brighton in the south coast of England, which is why I'm in darkness already today. Uh, and there's a thunderstorm going on outside, so apologies for that. And for those of you that don't know me, I'm Fiona McKinnon and I'm the CEO of Keynes. Uh, and I'm so delighted to be joined today by our very experienced and knowledgeable panel um, from Quark and uh, Dan from Dean uh, uh, Keynes as well. Um, I'll introduce the other panelists in just a sec, but I want to just um, to begin with to take the opportunity just to set a little bit of a scene around the subject of connected TV and why it's so important that we're talking about it. And I'm a data queen at heart. That's where I, I originally came from, very much in the programmatic and ad tech industry. So I love stats. So I wanted just to <laughs> set the scene with a few statistics. Um, and in case you didn't realize, Julie, if you can move the slide on, in case you didn't realize, connected TV is big. It's huge. I actually had that TV in the 1980s. That's obviously not connected, but the size of the market is enormous now. And it's thought that 87% of US households have at least one connected device. I mean, just think about your own household and, and behavior. How many devices do you watch on um, simultaneously and every day? If we move on again, but it's, it's not just about having huge reach, which makes the connected TV ad industry so important when you're looking at your marketing mix. Um, you know, when you look at IUB and they're saying that 21.2 billion is the projected connected TV ad spend in 2022, you can understand its importance and its growing importance in the overall marketing landscape. But I thought it was interesting here just to pull out a couple of stats that also really demonstrate engagement and performance around CTV as well. And particularly when cutting through to that younger audience and demographic, which maybe social media isn't as successful and able to do as it was in the past. And when I was looking at these statistics, one thing that really jumped out to me was how much more likely a younger audience are to watch ad su supported content versus paying for subscriptions, you know, 73%, which I don't know about you, I thought was a really high ad acceptance um, figure when you're looking at that um, uh, viewing experience. And when you marry all this together, it's, you know, the, the, those combined reasons are why a recent survey by the Trade Desk showed that 87% of marketers find that connected TV was as not, if not as successful, if not more successful than traditional TV routes. And that's because as Dan will touch on, we have the capabilities to add in data, and layer in other digital performance targeting metrics into this full screen TV experience. So this is, you know, it's important that we realize that this is an important place that we can not just um, launch our brands, but it's where we can grow our brands. Um, and particularly I feel as the next year and the economic climate becomes more of a conversation, which I'm sure we'll touch on today, 
discussing those ways in which you can reach your audience in a cost effective way where there's high engagement, there's high dwell time is going to become more and more important. And one could argue that it's almost more important to um, spend and market through a recession than it is in the in, in the boom times. You can get more cut through. And I'd love to explore that with the guys on the panel later as well. So we're going to be touching on ways in which we can reduce those financial barriers to working um, at high TV quality, reworking your assets through um, um, companies and the services that Quark provide, and also using platform data and channel expertise um, and skill and optimization through businesses like Keynes. So that's enough for me and a perfect segue to uh, introduce the panel. So as I said, I'm delighted to um, be joined today by Dan Larkman, who is the CEO and co-founder of Keynes Digital. Kim Sfarney, who's the Managing Director of Quark Creative, and Galen Draper, who is the Chief Creative Officer at Quark. So welcome, everybody. Great to have you here. Um, Dan, I'm going to flip over to you for just a second to share with everybody just a little bit more about what Keynes um, do, and then Kim and Galen, over to you to do the same before we start our questions. Love it. So, um, hi everyone, I'm Dan, Dan from Keynes. So to start with, I'm really excited for this conversation. We've had a number of conversations with Quirk in the past. We've done webinars, podcasts, et cetera. And we've really, we really enjoy partnering with Quirk. Um, just from the partners we've sent over their way in the past, they just, it's just a very seamless conversation. And that's why I love having these conversations. You know, they're really experts in creative. And to being able to back and forth with me being the, just like Fee says, the, the data geek in the room who um, has zero creative to pass that over to these guys with the creative. It's, it's, a, it's a great conversation, so I'm excited for it. Um, but who is Keen? So we're pioneering Connect TV for the past you know, five, five plus years. You know, really working with you know hundreds of brands from the D 2 C brands that are typically running social and search, and they're looking to expand their reach, all the way through to Fortune 500 companies that have been running TV ads and are looking for a little bit more from their TV strategy. And so it's it's everything from how do we help simplify the process of programmatic and connected TV, and take the complexity, simplify it, and use the data. Uh, the outcomes that we look at to really drive, you know, ultimate halo impact performance across connected TV, all channels, and really, really use this to to help the outcome of brands and brands grow. Um, and if we jump to the next slide, so when when we're thinking about, you know, just Keen's overall mini sales pitch here. When we're thinking about it, you know, it's it's human and machine as far as we're concerned. So we have a lot of data flowing. We've built a lot, we've built technology around business intelligence, and we have performance from technology, but we also have the performance from the humans. So we have our team working hand in hand with the technology to really drive the outcomes of the campaign, whether that's low funnel DR or that's upper funnel branding. And everything from target audience. How are we able to find your audience? And then really target them with the best message at the best time on the best shows. Um, and so really bringing this in full circle from premium inventory to best in class audiences to that human touch along with technology is what we do to really drive that outcome for our, for our partners. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and, and over to Quark team. Maybe you can just give us a little overview about your business. Sure. I'm Kim from Quark and thanks, Dan. Yeah, Dan and the Keynes team have been great partners, specifically when anyone is asking us from a client perspective, who is the best and more uh, knowledgeable in the CTV space and there are go-to partners there. So it's a great collaboration between both teams in terms of taking all the great insights and data that Dan's team can bring to the table and meshing that in with our creative recommendations as well, too. Um, so Quirk is a woman-owned founded agency. We're a one-stop shop for creative and production. So creative concepting, developing, pre-production, uh, post-production, the whole soup to nuts is done in-house. Um, there's a couple of methods in terms of messaging that we're experts in. Uh, brand, so more brand lift and brand recall. 
direct response. So those hard hitting sales increases, you need website traffic increase, but then there's kind of a meld between the two, which is brand response, which is what we typically get the most requests for. So not something too high level where it's like, I just don't need my brand awareness to be out there, but not so hard hitting infomercially, but a meld between the two where you want something that looks elevated, professional, but also drive sales. G, do you want to talk about all the different channels we work in? Yeah. And I mean, if anyone tells you that they can just make one video and put it across, just take that one video, you made your 30 seconds and you're going to just put it on every channel, they're wrong. You can have one shoot day, but we make videos that are specific for the targets, for the KPIs across so many different places, whether that's CTV, linear TV, radio, podcasts, YouTube, even Amazon, um, social. And as we dive in today, we're going to unveil a bunch of secrets about what you can do, um, whether it's going on CTV or to any of these other um, different placements. Great. Thank you for that. And you've already created a few questions in my mind and interesting points there, particularly around that assumption that, hey, I've got one video, I could just put it everywhere and it's going to work, right? Why wouldn't it work? So I know we're going to get into, into that. That's great. So we've we kind of set the scene um, now about why this is so important and why 2023 in particular can really kind of bring results um, for people. And what I would like to do is get quite sort of practical and tactical now so that people have those takeaways and those insights that they can they can take away with them. And I think it's fair to say that a lot of people feel that that quote that CT that TV quality ad might just be a little bit out of their reach. You know, we think of the Super Bowl ads, we think of that high quality in production. We just think maybe I just don't have the right assets. Um, Kim, Galen, do you want to kind of kick us off by maybe walking us through some of the first things brand could consider if they want to get started on a budget? And to your point there, Galen, you know, hey, you've got one shoot day, but you already, I would imagine, need to be thinking about the different environments that you want to be be using that content for. Uh, Kim, do you want to? Yeah, I can talk <laughs> about um, yeah. Yeah, There's two different <laughs> options that typically, if we're looking at a lower budget or looking just to test into the CTV market, um, one of them is footage rework. So that's where it's probably best when a brand already has a content library, whether it be uh, customer testimonials, B-roll, a product shoot. In an ideal scenario, you've probably tested on other channels in the past. Um, maybe you have some performance learnings about what scenes are working, what kind of messaging is working. And essentially, Court can take a look at all of that footage and come back to you with a plan of attack, whether it be frame boards and new scripts where we're taking the existing footage and we're adding new voiceover or bringing in different value props or bringing in different supers. So there's a lot that we can do. And a, the first step of that process is typically just to like, let Quark look at your whole library. Let us come back to you and see, is there five sixties we can get out of this? Is there thirties we can get out of this? Um, and that's a pretty low lift because what we're doing on our end is just taking that footage and re-editing and redoing super. So no shoots required. You probably have a lot of this to work with again from past types of testimonials or product shoots you've done. Um, the other way you can get into CTV would be animation. So maybe you haven't done shoots. Maybe you're a younger brand and you're like, I'm not sure even what our brand style looks like. We can do, you know, a more of an explainer video where if you have a more complicated product and you're like, okay, let's go step by step. And I want something very specific um, to explain our product. It's also great if you have sort of an illustration style where maybe you just want to expand what you've created for your website and bring that more into the video space. So there's a plenty of different directions, again, that are a lower lift that doesn't require a full shoot, cropping wardrobe, all of those things. And that can also be done super quickly. So we tend to do our footage reworks and animations pending the length of the videos four weeks, three weeks, sometimes we've done them in two weeks if we really just need to tack on a new VO um, and get it out into the market for you all to test. 
And I just add one more thing onto this. I know footage rework is among one of the most sexy marketing terms that you probably heard, right? <laughs> you know, as you dreamed in this job, you're like, oh yeah, I can't wait for the footage rework. That's gonna be the one I show my parents during the holidays. But let's not discount what it is. You know, your brand might have a bunch of library, you might be that you might have captured some motion during like a product shoot. You might have some testimonials. And listen, if it's if it's a direction we don't want to go, there's a lot of ways um, we, we can go. And, and if, if we really don't like that, there's a lot of ways we can cover it up and, and change it. But in the end, we have this 30 seconds or 15 seconds that are going to be driven by a story and a consumer insight that's going to connect with an audience. And we have seen a lot of success out there. Um, with really much more minimalist animation or footage rework. And we have a couple examples that we'll show you today where brands went out with, maybe they, they got excited and they, they made a huge, beautiful mantra spot that got employees really excited and it was beautifully shot. And they were like, this is going to the Super Bowl. But when they put all their budget into it, it didn't move a single needle, not a single <laughs> razor was sold. And so they came to us and they're like, we have this beautiful footage, but we don't know how to connect with the audience. And so we say, okay, your razors are $9. We're gonna make sure that at the end of 30 seconds, it's gonna look pretty, but they are sure as hell gonna know that our razors cost $9. And that's what we do. Um, and so it's not just sacrificing what you've done in the past. It's not just uh, re rehashing things that maybe you don't like. It's, it's looking at it, trying to find that insight um, that's gonna connect to a con consumer and put it out there in 15 or 30 seconds. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like you're almost, um, with the rework, there's there's almost a, a secondary benefit, right, where you're giving those brands a little bit of feedback on their previous approach. And you, in that example, which I think we can bring up, you have an example that it didn't work. So what can you do to innovate? And what were the key messages that, you know, you get lost in the, I've created this really sexy brand ad but I haven't actually communicated what the point of my product is. I haven't communicated my main selling point. So it sounds like you were really able to draw that out and add that as the ad benefit and the real call to action that was previously perhaps missing. And I'd say something too, if you want to really look in the mirror, take this away. If you're a CMO out there, if you're considering doing this, uh, there is a big push within many companies as things get changed over that they have this library and they're like, no, I'm here because I need to make my mark. And what does that mean? It means revising the brand guidelines <laughs> forever. It means doing a new photo shoot. It means doing a new video shoot. And you'd be so surprised how big a content library that's often not even used is, is sitting uh, that you have the rights to already, that you already have the hard drives to. Um, and we're working with a client right now that's like that. They have so much gold and they sent us like, it was something like 20 terabytes of hard drives and we spent like a week going through it. And we pulled out a bunch of stuff and edited it together. They're about to run on TV. They're very happy about it. And they were like, oh my God, one, I forgot about this too. I didn't even know we filmed this. Um, and that was, you know, at a, a fraction of the price of what a whole new, you know, campaign and, and video shoot would be. Um, but hopefully it will have similar results to what that, you know, that would have been. Um, let, let's have a look at the example we can. And then Dan, I'd like to follow up by asking you around the kind of strategies ar around those different kind of performance metrics and the different types of campaigns um, that the brands should be looking at beyond just that creative element. But what are the other elements that can be added in to help with that performance decision making and insight? And um, so did we, did you want to go to Athena yeah. or? Yeah, we can show this yeah. one and just, just to yeah. set expectations. So this was exactly, they had done a big brand spot and to be fair, they may have had brand KPIs, brand awareness that they did tackle. But at this point they came to us and said, we need to turn this into a more of a performance marketing spot. We have a couple messages that we want to get out there. Um, we have all this beautiful footage. How are we going to get it to talk about these messages? And so in this case, this was about their $9 razors. Um, so we took this beautiful footage, went through a couple of rounds, new voiceover, new music, new edits, uh, new scripting, um, and then put on graphics and this is what ran on TV or CTV. Play video, play VT. <laughs> oh, we can't hear the sound. Yes. It worked in practice. It did. Judy, you want to restart it? You just have to unmute yourself. Oh, 
And I think it's okay. I mean, it was also made for a sound off environment. So <laughs> you can see the $9 message gets through. But if you want to try it one more time, then a better luck. Our nine, our nine. There we go. Perfect. You are nine dollars away from a shade that just clicks. You, you, and you are nine dollars away from smooth gliding up, down, and all around your unique curves. You are nine dollars away from never having to set foot in a drugstore again. Because at Athena Club, we make razors that come to you with curve knowing handles, perfectly spaced blades, and hydrating water activated serum. You are nine dollars away from the best shave ever. Get your $9 razor kit at athenaclub.com. And you can see how this drives home a performance message, but doesn't sacrifice brand. It's still exciting. It's still something you're going to want to show your mom and dad during the holidays when you point it out on CTV, um, but definitely with the more uh, direct response message. And I think something else uh, brands are coming to us for is maybe they want to get on TV immediately and we have a big shoot in the work. So that was the case for Athena Club where they needed to be on air, they had a plan, but they also wanted to refresh creative. So this can also be a stop gap to get something up very quickly, not time consuming, again, three to four weeks while we parallel path a full blown shoot for them for later on in the year. So tons of different ways just to make sure you're not waiting mm -hmm. eight to nine weeks to do a full production as well. Well, that's actually something I was going to ask you on. Obviously, we've got, you know, the holidays coming up. It's a bit tight for Black Friday, but say someone on the on the call has um, on the, has a budget for Christmas time. You know, what's how fast can something theoretically be turned around? Well, we just shipped all the Black Friday shop spots <laughs> over the weekend. So, yeah, well, our slate is ready for, for any last minute Christmas edits we're in. <laughs> That is good to know. So, so Dan, let me let me bring you on, and we'll look at one other um, example in just a second. But Dan, what are some of the other things? You know, we've got this great creative now. We're good to go. What are some of the other things that brands on a budget, outside of creative, should be should be thinking about? I think uh, I think just to start with, when you just look at the creative, it's something that we talk about with with some of our brands. If you notice throughout this ad, there's a URL throughout. It looks, but it doesn't look out of place. And so I think that by itself, when we talk about creative and the fact that you guys could turn this around really fast for this brand, it's still done in a way that looks like it's meant for the TV screen. And the reason that I push on that is that we did an analysis uh, about a month back of one of our brands, their top performing creative was made for TV. They took that same asset. And when we talk about specific channels, they took that same asset, added a skin around it. So it looked more like a YouTube ad. We ran that. That was their worst performing TV ad. The exact same video with that skin went from best to worst. And so I think that's when we talk about creative for channel and the data behind it. These tiny little variables make a substantial difference to what the actual outcome is going to be. But when we're looking specifically for a budget, right? You know, what we're always going to look at is we're always going to act like consultants. So we're going to be asking specific questions about the advertiser. What's the you know, users to the site? What, what's the outcome they're looking to achieve, right? And then what we're going to do is take that information and work out what's possible. So let's say you have a huge brand that wants to spend $20,000 a month and try and see Lyft in users to the site probably unlikely. So we're going to look at how do we create geo-targeting and geo-testing. You know, are you looking for direct response where we're talking about ROAS, CPAs, um, or are you looking for brand response where maybe it's more users to the site or just branding, right? It's new year, new year, new product. Maybe it's health or something, a gym, you know, they, they love to advertise in January, Right. And it's more about less about signups, subscriptions and more about brand awareness. It changes the dynamic. But when we're talking about dipping your toe in the connected TV water, building out an asset from the units you already have and then linking that with which audience, what's the outcome I'm looking to achieve. Um, and for us, we're always going to lean on if we can drive users to the site and we, we're going to have a direct impact on your other paid medias. So if we can drive someone to the site at a cost-effective rate 
somewhere in the region of non-branded paid search, then we're passing the baton over to Facebook custom audiences, paid search, display retargeting to actually get that, that new user who's never been exposed to your brand into yeah. the conversion funnel and then actually becoming a customer, right? Let us drive people there with units like this and then let the other channels that can drive that low funnel action, that's always going to be where we suggest. And so more the brand response area would be where we would think is the sweet spot for, you know, on a budget and your know, units like this. And um, how differently do you approach, and this is to everyone, do, approach brands that are looking for direct response versus branding? Um, and what are the different calls to action that you would recommend go into each of those different types of creative and targeting strategies? So I could speak from a um, from the delivery perspective. Um, the the few things that we would always talk about when you're looking at direct response is what does the creative messaging have in it, right? And just from performance, a strong end card. Like we actually have uh, a, a whole series on our website which is reviewing creatives. For, for DR or for branding, because they kind of have different goals, right? Um, when we're thinking about direct response, my goal of the ad is to make you pick up a second device and come to the website. My goal of branding is to keep you keep you interested in the brand and remembering who the brand is. Slightly different goals and slightly different targeting. When we're thinking about direct response, the audience we're going to target are most likely to convert. That's what we're going after. In a programmatic setting, we're bidding in real time on users. So we want to pay the least possible to get the highest yield, right? That's direct response. When we're thinking brand response, we're still targeting a, an audience, but an audience of customers that are likely to come to your site and likely to become customers but we're less worried about them converting in the next week because they can convert in the next four weeks, six weeks. That's okay because we're trying to drive them there. And then when we go the whole way to branding, our focus changes to be, how do I introduce people to your brand? I'm not trying to get an action. I'm trying to get them to understand who you are and that you're a player in, in, this, um, in the market. And when we're thinking about, I mean, you, you mentioned it earlier, Fee, when we talked about you know, Super Bowl ads and people thinking about along those lines, that's the beauty of Connected TV, the brand equity element. We don't talk about enough, but the fact that you can run an ad for a brand that's D2C brand that you know started in 2020, they could be running an ad right next to the All States and the Nikes of the world on the same TV show at the same network and their brand equity is lifted as long as a creative element's great, they get that brand equity with it, which also adds that element that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I thought it was awesome to like an awesome breakdown. I think from a creative standpoint, it's completely different of how you're approaching the narrative. You know, if you're talking about someone making, uh, taking an action within five minutes, we talk about, you know, how are we gonna make sure that, that they're gonna take an action within five minutes of seeing this ad? You're talking about, about an ad that's maybe problem solution oriented, that has urgency, that has FOMO, that has all of these uh, hidden moments of like, oh shit, I can't wait till tomorrow. <laughs> this is what I need right now, oh my God. And, and on the other side of the spectrum, if you're talking about brand lift brand, uh, you know, you, of course the classic, brand spots or what you see in the Super Bowl, but it's about making a, an impression. It's about, it's about staying with you for a couple of days. It's about, you know, Budweiser. You're not going to go out and order Budweiser on your phone, but next time you're at the bar, you're going to be like, damn, I don't know why, but I'm a little thirsty, you know, because that, that's what, that, that's what we're, we've ingrained in your head with something that's surprising uh, and that speaks to a larger brand. I think what we balance and what most of our clients, especially looking at you know, if we're going to recession, not a recession, whatever is happening, uh, that a, a lot of our clients come to us for this made up marketing term called brand response, which is exactly what you think, which is somewhere in the middle, which is I don't want to have an ad that looks like a, an infomercial that sells chainsaws at two in the morning, where it's like a guy talking for 20 minutes to the camera and yelling. They, want, they work, right? Yeah. 
I don't want that type of performance. <laughs> ad. You know, maybe maybe if there's any chainsaw companies, we'll gladly we'll gladly work with you. Um, but I don't want that ad. But I also want to make sure that my market that this channel is working for me and that you know I'm under the pressure with tightening budgets to get a performance return. And so we really whether it's from the takeaways of here animation and and and. Um, and footage rework, or whether you're doing something that's net new, uh, we really try to marry the emotional brand elements, the visual brand elements that you can get with a much more performance driven script. Uh, exactly like Dan was saying, you know, a strong, simple in card showing a lower third on screen, making sure the audience at any time when they look up knows exactly what action uh, we want them to take. Yeah, it's that emotion that's really important, actually, in both. We always think that it's just in that branding, but that's the immediacy of the reaction and the emotion that you're driving that really speaks to the direct response, the names, the names in the title, right? So it's really interesting. Um, perhaps we can show your other example at this point yeah. as well, your animation, because I know for me, I think when I see animation, gosh, that must have cost a lot of money. That's something that has been created from scratch. Um, and I'd also like to touch on licensing as, as part of that as well, because it's something that crosses my mind of, you know, is this a costlier way um, to get across that message? Because I'm almost creating brand assets completely from scratch, I'm assuming. I don't know. I, over to you guys to explain. But maybe we can show this example of, of Babel and you can you can talk us through what drove of them. Course. To be and I, I can tee this up really quickly. So Babel's a longtime client, an amazing product. We've worked both uh, in the US and internationally with them and we've done a litany of shoots, live action animation. Um, and this was exactly the case. They had just launched a new website and they had started uh, with this type of line drawing style and they needed to go to, we were working on some footage rework of testimonials they had of people all, all over the world, as well as uh, building out an animated spot. And we said, okay, let's do it. We need to get to market quickly um, with it. And we made 60s, 30s and 15s. And this spot was so successful for them that they didn't even, this is the one example I've ever seen. They didn't even make a radio spot specifically. They just took the audio from this animated spot, put on a radio, and it followed me around New York City, wherever I was for, <laughs> for years. Uh, but yeah, take a look. So this was based off of their, us taking off their new um, brand look and feel and putting it into a, a 2D animation TV spot. Awesome. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but thought it would be too difficult? Then try Babbel. Babbel starts by teaching you words and phrases that gradually get more complex. Soon, you're practicing short conversations. So in 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking a new language in a few weeks. Babbel works because it's built around real life. It teaches you everyday practical conversations that you will actually use. Babbel, language for life. Try it free at babbel.com. And just to elaborate on it, it's a really simple spot. It's not very flashy, but it's super effective at getting people to take action because the number one issue in this space, the number one insight is uh, you're not actually against Duolingo. You're not actually against the other Rosetta Stones out there. The, 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 the biggest problem of learning a new language is yourself. And so the thing that Babbel does that they do better than any of their competitors is they don't start with grammar lessons and bring you back to second grade French class where you get like really, you know, uh, upset and have bad memories of that. They teach you actual phrases that you can use immediately. Um, and that's what the ad, you know, that's why 15 seconds of the ad talks about that you're learn using uh, language from real life. Um, and so that's it. That's the story, whether it's done in a live action setting or it's done with this 2D animation, it's effective because it's a, it's an insight that consumers who are thinking about learning a language want to know and, and, it's, and it's straightforward. And this is why I say, if you're budget conscious here, there's no reason that you can't make something that's going to look like your brand and still perform great because it really comes down to what the consumer insight and your differentiator is and us helping you package that up in, in 15 or 30 seconds. Great, Kim, I, I sense you wanted to, um, when I when I mentioned licensing, I saw you shaking <laughs> your head and I just wondered if, um, if there's any kind of, you know, hidden things that people might imagine are, are going to kind of come out the woodwork once they've got these great ads created. Do you take care yeah. of all of that process? 
Yeah. So for the footage rework process, again, if you're sitting on a landmine of voiceovers, testimonials, product shoots, um, our accounts team is really great and collaborative in terms of working with your team, um, getting everything transferred over to us, whether it be sending a hard drive or uploading to a, a cloud system. And what our team will do is kind of run through and see what you have to work with. A lot of the times you guys do have talent releases that are associated with the different times of shoots. If we have a very expensive voiceover that you've used before, we can kind of X the voiceover, if, especially if it's product type videos and put on a new one. And then our team would be handling the negotiation. If it's an ownership of the footage, we can also work with your team to go through those talent releases and see if there's something that needs to be renegotiated as well too. I think footage reworks work the best when you do have some ownership of your footage, you can pay us all the paperwork or over to us, our production team, and have us go back through and renegotiate any deals you might need. Um, product shoots obviously make it a lot simpler if you're not dealing with a lot of talent that are in the spots. Um, very simple. You guys own the footage. It's easy to negotiate. But a lot of the times what we do is recommend new music, new voiceover. So we're starting from scratch with these new edits and just utilizing the assets that you had before. And that makes the complications of making this turn into a very expensive spot. The one caveat I will give, if you're working with celebrity spots and old footage, there's SAG implications, all of those types of things that make it a little bit more difficult. But the, the average client that comes to us is really like the Athena club where it's like, we have all these great shoots. How do we put it together and just put a new um, message over it and supers and what have you? And it's super simple. But Quark's the team who will end up taking all of those contracts, sorting it out for you and giving you a plan of next steps. And I just say, even though it's in post, the team is still led by a commercial film director that's in-house. Mm -hmm. So all, we have five commercial film directors on our staff. So whether they're doing live action or working with a client in this capacity, you're having someone who's approaching it as a veritable CTV spot that's going to go out, get a lot of views. Um, and, and so you have that in terms of who's leading the, the charge. And this is, this is also one of the reasons that, yeah, we, we love working with, um, Quirk in the past and, 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 and current clients. It's, it's the fact of everything that's been explained is, seems really complex. But when we're thinking about the heavy lifting that both sides will do, we're actually taking that off the plate of the advertiser specifically. It sounds like I'm going to have this legal framework that I have to work out as an advertiser. I'm going to have to work out which networks to go and buy individually, what audiences, what my reporting looks like, how I'm going to rework my creative. That's not the case here. And that's why this conversation, this relationship works so well, is that we're really looking at how do we take that off your plate and make it more of a, you know, a, let us be part of the team. Let us take the areas where we're experts at and let's make sure it's aligned with your business objectives. And I think that's the thing that really works really well when it comes to Connect TV. And especially when you're testing it for the first time, the last thing you want to do is do a full production shoot, spend $150,000, $300,000 on a TV commercial, run it, and then think it's, eh, did this work? Did this not work? Am I sure I want to spend that much? Whereas instead, we can take units and actually do that heavy lifting and test it before that full rollout. And I think that's always a crucial part of why the, why part, why this this type of partnership has worked really well in the past. And 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 a, a good segue, I guess, to talk about that actual testing element and what what kind of budgets and what kind of timings would you say, Dan, make sense for 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 testing? And also, how many types of creative, how many messages should you test? Do you recommend? there's a kind of control in a test group when when someone is starting starting out um i love this question when it comes through and i'm going to answer it with a it depends um <laughs> the, the the rule of thumb that we say is for every ten thousand dollars a set of creative or one creative you don't that doesn't need, mean if you're spending a hundred thousand dollars you need 10 10 creatives but it means that what, what we typically find, especially brands that are moving from social over to connected TV or testing it, the lever you have to control in social is creative. That's the, the biggest lever. And you're changing that every week, every you know, 10 days, that type of stuff. With connected TV, we've run the same hero creative for a brand for 18 months. 
and they're still seeing great performance off the back of it. And so I think that how we need to look at it is when you're starting out, let's get a set of creatives and let's get enough data around that one video or maybe two videos to see the performance. Um, and so when we're thinking about you know, budget, you can go as low as you know, test out Connect TV at $20,000. You can scale that up massively really fast. And it's really the question I will always ask everyone at initial consultation level is how much are you spending on other media channels and what do you want the outcome to be? Right. We've seen that if you're not doing anything in in branding or anything on you know brand response currently, you probably want to be spending about 50% of your budget on some level of branding and awareness for new to file customers. Um, if you're spending less than that, yeah, and 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 then if you're looking for DR, how much are you spending on other channels? You know, uh, and and what does that look like a total mix? Right. Because what you don't want to do is take all of your Facebook budget and put it into connected TV because you're going to wonder why all these conversions aren't happening. You want to be making sure you're filling that funnel up and letting custom audience, Facebook, you know, paid search really drive those conversions. So I think it really depends on, on where you're sitting. Um, but there's a lot that can be done with a really limited budget around connected TV testing, proving it out and then progressing. Dan, can I just ask you, um, someone's asked if you can just clarify the first part of what you said at the beginning there. So for every $10,000 you recommend, it was a, a creative. Yeah. So just at that point. Yeah. Um, so no more than one set of creatives every $10,000. So you could run one, one video and you could be spending half a million dollars with one video and that's fine. What you don't want to do is spend $20,000 and have 10 videos running because you're not going to get enough data against each of them to be able to tell which one works and which one didn't. Anything less than $10,000, you're basically probably not going to get enough data to be able to make a st statistical significant response or, or outcome from it. So that's basically what I'm saying is you can run one video consistently, but try and make sure you at least spend $10,000 if you're going to be doing testing. I'm just checking one point to add there too I know like there's the assumption of when you do photo shoots or video shoots that you leave typically with just one 30 second or one 15 second spot if you do have more money to invest I think one of Pork's strong points is is we're going to give you different variations different value propositions to test if you do just need to update end cards or seasonality new offers, things like that. It's not as a high of a lift as doing the core editing of the spot. Like those are very quick optimizations. If Dan gets learnings of like, uh, I don't know if this offer is performing, let's try something else or let's try this other value proposition. That's something easy for Quark to turn around and give you new assets so you can put those immediately into market. Change that nine dollars to an eight for yeah that. right. The price has changed. It needs to be 12. Right. Like that. <laughs> That's true. And, and um, do you, do you feel that you, the brands that you have worked with that have tested connected to TV, they're starting to now see this channel being an almost evergreen, it's part of the existing marketing mix and, and, and actually perhaps becoming the lead in terms of decision making of creative and messaging. Have you seen a shift in that at all over, over the last couple of years? I mean, it's always in most of our clients' plans. Occasionally, they will add linear to test it out just to see what the deal is. But a starting point, we usually always see TVT, CBT, OTT included, and then maybe some add-ons for social. But those are the majority of the plans in terms of the brands that Quark works with, for sure. Great. Dan, have I lost you or are you still there? <laughs> Sorry. Just for a second. The camera was playing up. Um I, I think that we see a number of people thinking about Connect TV as an evergreen, right? I think when people start testing it, they're going to see that performance off the back of it, right? And they're going to see why driving users via a second screen or a different screen, a different environment really makes a difference for them. Like when we're thinking about social, you're seeing the majority of ads being on mobile. When you're thinking about Connect TV or OTT, the majority is going to be the TV screen. Just that different environment, I think, makes a massive difference for, for brands, introducing people to the brand. <clears throat> and candidly, you give someone a 30-second ad, that's the exploration. You can tell someone in that 30-second message, 
who you are, why they should come to your site. When you're thinking about a social ad or a paid search, you're going to get someone clicking on a link and then exploring when they're on the site. It's really just, can we shorten that funnel, get people to the site that are qualified, that are more likely to become customers? And, and, and on that, can um, I'll come back to you on this one as well, Dan. We've got a question from Jesse in the, in, in the chat. For companies that are looking for more direct response results, do you see CTV being effective for that? And how do we track that? And I guess that's open to, to, to the whole panel to answer, because I guess there's a, a data analysis and measurement, but there's also a, um, how do you create the results from a, a creative perspective as well? Yeah, I mean, can you use it for uh, low funnel DR? 100%. Uh, we can look at it from a CPA point of view, from a ROAS point of view. And how we track it is a lot of the technology that we partner with. So we use the gold standard cross device companies, so the four leading cross device companies. And the reason we partner with them is they're going to tell us within 95% confidence of the other devices associated with the, with the user who's been watching it, let's say on their TV screen. So having that ability means that we're able to track that user from ad on their Samsung TV via Apple TV through to their iPhone and onto their PC, right? We're able to track that user. And by doing that, we're able to show you how much did it cost to drive that user from seeing the TV ad through to the site. And then does that user, when they land on the site, actually go and take an action? Do they become a customer rather than just you know one of the users to the site? And so we're using that cross-device technology to tell us how many of those users come through. Um, and then what we also do, and again, it very much depending, that's really when we're, when we're testing it out. We also suggest to a lot of our partners to work with company like a measured, where they're, again, third-party uh, attribution, third-party lift studies, so people can actually see the true impact. Because unlike a, a social that's majority mobile or paid search that you can only click on, you, really, you, you shouldn't and can't see the impact of connected TV in a platform like Google Analytics, right? because it's a non-clickable media. And so what we really need to be looking at is how does it impact the total media mix? How does it impact your social? How does it impact your search? Um, and so what we'll look at is DR as a channel. We'll also look at the impact to other paid media. Because when you're looking at it in a silo and you're comparing connected TV to um, uh, Facebook retargeting, right? I've driven, how many users did we get to the site? What was the conversion for it? What was the ROI that I got off the back of these ads is going to be what we show you plus the halo impact on all the other channels, which we'll also show you. And I guess the um, Athena example uh, is a good one of, of a direct response, right? That was a very clear call to action. Sign up here, $9 a month, get going, get, get, get smooth. <laughs> Have you, have you, uh, and, and do you get the feedback from your clients around the DR response you, yourselves, um, Kim and Galen? Do people say this yeah. is this is the response? We got X number of customers. You, you, you can see that as well. Most of our clients are pretty forthcoming. If that's part of their KPIs, they want to hit a certain, uh, you know, cost per acquisition, whatever it is. Uh, and then what we do for every client is uh, once they have their flight, we check in. Um, and, you know, we can work with them if it's something that's quickly in terms of changing variations, we can work immediately to get those. If there's long term, uh, you know, we have we have for our long term clients, you know, we probably weathered three, four years with them and we have that much learnings in terms of much higher stuff in terms of positioning insights that are working. Uh, you know, we have we have some clients that are going on CTV the first time and they're like, we don't know if our brand is really funny or really serious. And so we take <laughs> them, you know, whether it's through animation or footage rework, you know, we make them two completely different ads. And the next time they're like, okay, people look like funny. And that that informs whatever we do moving forward. So, uh, you know, we, we try to be uh, as as connected as possible to them, uh, not just, you know, it's not just you hand us a hard drive and we hand it back. Like our success is gonna be obviously, so roll your eyes, please. Our success is your success. No, but we wanna, we want, we, we want these ads to crush it. We want ultimately to drive sales and so we can keep working together and, and make cool things. Great. And, and I suppose the, um, 
the other thing with the direct response is Dan pointed out, it, it is more challenging because it's non-skippable, non-clickable media that we have, but it is full screen, it's full experience. There are clever ways that you can create offers, promotions, URLs, uh, codes, I guess, that are, are specific to the ad that's seen on connected TV versus other environments that can be a test for a direct response as well. It's a bit of a blunt instrument, but it is it is another way that, that, that you can do that relatively easily. I have a 15 second response to that. And Dan, this is probably more in your environment, but from a creative side, we always, if we can go on with a couple different in card variations, we recommend it. You would be so surprised how it really depends on the vertical. You'll have a client that says just a simple in card going to the website, and that will ultimately track better than a promo. It just depends on what the promo is, what the vertical is, you know, and how it's positioned. And so giving our clients a couple different options and, and being able to go to market to test is ultimately what's best. What, what we've seen works best in terms of getting a good result. Yeah, and I would, I would say that I, I, think about, I think about things like URLs and tracking and, and other ways of, of tracking, uh, great basic indicators. I think that what we need to be looking at when we're thinking about a medium like this is the impact on other paid, paid media channels. Like I'm always nervous when I speak to someone and their first answer is I, I am running Facebook, I have a CPA of this, I need a CPA of this on, on um, Connect TV, because my question is always the same, which is like, what do you want to see as an overall marketing? That's where, we, that's where we shine, is how do we help from an overall marketing point of view of driving those users through, right? If I'm introducing someone to a brand who's never seen this brand before, and on the first touch, but you're looking at last touch attribution in GA, that might be a six-week sales cycle. It might be a three-week sales cycle. It might be an eight-week sales cycle, right? Without knowing that, I'm going to have to serve them. I'm going to have to introduce them to the brand and keep making sure I'm serving them so I take credit for it. Or do I just want to bring it on and then let the other channels that maybe are lower CPMs and are uh, more on the retargeting side of things. So I want them to actually drive the end conversion. So I've taken it from your paid search was... Um, you were spending $1,000 a day to now you're spending $2,000 a day because you have more users searching for you, right? Or searching for your products. How do we help that overall lift? So you're getting the ROI as a, from a halo point of view. I would always lean on that um, for success. But uh, again, I think you're right, the end card and how unique they can be. That's where I love most of the testing, right? Do we want to be direct telling people, here is an offer, come to the site. Do we just want to put the URL up? And I think that testing that out for different brands does make a big difference. Yeah, great. It's always the way that we get into the nitty gritty and the good detail just as we have to wrap up. So unfortunately, we've only got kind of five or six um, minutes left. But I, and, and thank you very much for everything that you've shared, guys. I've, I've taken lots away from this. I actually have a consumer brand on my side hustle and I'm thinking hmm, maybe I've got some good creative I need to send you guys to see um but I I wanted just to end it's the end coming towards the end of the year already everyone's already thinking about Q1 budgets and next year planning already and I thought it might be fun just to end with a little bit of a new year's resolution from what you'd like to see change you'd like to see in your business so what you kind of want to set forward with and what your goals are and maybe a new year's resolution for the for the industry what change you'd like to see there who am i going to pick on first dan of course <laughs> of course um uh i guess from a business point of view i'm always kind of thinking about the internal side of things more so than the external um and so i guess it's uh i guess it comes to from a business point of view is increasing knowledge of the connected tv space of the industry in general and how and really increasing knowledge and freeing up time so that people can focus on things that, that they enjoy about marketing in general or, or just passion projects. Uh, I think from a business point of view, that would probably be more of my focus is how does the business help everyone with that internally uh, that therefore will help the external teams. Um, I, from an industry, maybe Netflix not charging like a, a million dollar CPMs that they, they're touting, these ridiculous CPMs. Oh, I thought maybe I talk about Netflix. <laughs> maybe that, maybe that's a good one. Um, I'd like to see in 2023 some more checks and balances around 
you know, um, using third parties to to validate performance of all media channels. So not just connect TV, but audio, you know, connect TV, digital, you know, all of all different channels. I think more checks and balances there would be really beneficial um, that aren't linked necessarily to the media company. Right. You know, third party to the media companies, I think will be really beneficial in in helping. We already seen massive growth of connect TV. But I think the all third party tests we've done have been so positive that like I encourage that the more we do, the more people are going to see the true value of, of a channel like this. Right. You've had your time. So it's knowledge and greater measurement and insights for the industry and, and Netflix, and Netflix. To be, and Netflix to be yes. more, more accessible for everyone. Yeah. Kim. Yeah, um, I'm super excited about how Quark has been expanding our capabilities in terms of the animation space. I think what we showed you with Babel is very 2D, 3D light lift, but we've done amazing VFX work for clients such as Nottum, SecureWorks. Um, there's a couple more in the pipeline. So really expanding our capabilities there because I think there's a lot more interesting work that can be done. Um, and we've recently launched our Fem Health practice so a lot of time and energy has gone into that in terms of us expanding the work on female focused brands where a majority female agency. So making sure you've got, you know, your audience working on those type of products is super important to us. So we're really thrilled about that. And for the industry, I think probably just being a little bit less competitive about things. Like I feel like everyone's trying to hold on to their budgets for next year. And I think we have a lot of great partnerships like ours with Keens, where there's a lot to go around and share and make things more efficient for all of our clients. So oh, I should have ended with you, Kim. Now, Galen, you've got you a two minutes to do, <laughs> do better yeah. than collaboration and room yeah. for everybody. Getting along. <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah, I mean, if I have 30 seconds, I'd say the thing that I look forward to most next year from a creative standpoint is. There's been lists kicked around about how to hack DRTV and how to, and, and what you end up is a bunch of ads that all look the same, founder spots, testimonials, you know, how to explain our videos. And we found it's like, if everyone's making the same spot, your spot won't perform. And so I think being super creative and going back to being surprising and being different is huge as it is every year. Um, and then the thing that I'll rail against that I hope the industry changes, um, paid pitches. It's something our CEO, Merrill Merrill, Merrill Drake, always talks about. You know, if you had an architect, you wouldn't ask five architects to design your house for free and then just pick one and pay them at the end. So if you really want a good creative team to spend time thinking about your brand and your RFP, you should pay them for your time because the output will be better. And you should not just pay them for your time. Uh, you should spend some time with them so they can download and understand your brand. And I think that's something that hopefully will be a bygone era uh, element. Of, yeah, what you pay for world. in the world, right? Exactly. You get what you pay for. <laughs> Great. Well, this was a free webinar. So everybody's got an amazing amount from it. Thank you so much um, for, for joining us today. This has been recorded. So anyone that registered will get a copy of the recording and feel free to share it around and we will on our channels as well but thank you so much dan galen and kim for joining me thank you. and, and for everybody you. else that joined us live as well great conversation have a great day everybody thank you everyone thanks Bye. Bye -bye. Bye.